Renal physiology. Primordial sea. Oceans of nephrology. Just to take a pee. <laughs> okay. Urine. Oh, it's so fun. Uh, Hippocrates, let's go back and talk about this aspect of Hippocrates. Um, you know, we, we talked about the Hippocratic Oath and the, the concept of uh, physiologi that uh, he established, uh, that, that disease had physical origins, right? Well, uh, following along that thread of thought, that stream of thought, shall we say, um, he... Uh, established the discipline of uroscopy, uh, which is the inspection of urine. So he would uh, look at the um, color of, of urine and whether there were bubbles, or what kind of bubbles, how foamy it was, what did the urine smell like, uh, mm, what did it taste like. Uh, in fact, the words diabetes, the, the word diabetes just means, uh, it comes from uh, diuresis, which means to uh, urinate, excessive urination. So diabetes is a disease characterized by excessive urination. And uh, the two terms for diabetes, diabetes mellitus, which is the one that most people think of, um, that is related to blood sugar regulation, and then there's another type of diabetes called diabetes insipidus. These two words, does anyone know what the word mellitus or insipidus uh, refer to? So uh, mellitus me is, uh, comes from the, word, the root, which means sweet, just like uh, mellifluous is a sweet melody that you would hear. Diabetes mellitus is urine that Hippocrates took a swig of. He's like, oh, it's not so bad. It's kind of sweet. I taste sweet, um, whereas uh, diabetes insipidus, on the other hand, some person who is insipid is just uh, bitter and uh, caustic. So it was urine that when you took a sip, you didn't actually want to take another. Uh, not <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, uroscopy. Um, Galen, and I just recently I had some fun... Uh, last night coloring his eyes red there because <laughs> it's, this is kind of like the, the, the evil side of, of Galen uh, <clears throat> for any animal rights individuals out there. Uh, he identified that the kidneys were actually the organ that produced urine and he did this by clamping, uh, so cutting open uh, apes and clamping off tying off their ureters, and then watching the kidneys swell in those poor animals. Yeah, yeah, Galen. Well, anyways, uh, did identify that it was the kidney that made uh, what was the organ that gave rise to uh, urine. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this whole process of understanding urine continued into the 1600s where we had uh, a, a sort of a renaissance, so to speak, of uroscopy. Uh, and we see here people of all walks of life that were not feeling well uh, would go to a uroscopist, uh, pee in a glass jar, they would look at it, smell it, swig it, whatever they did to it, uh, and to determine what was wrong with you. And there was, um, I don't have a picture on here, I should put one. Actually, I have it right here. I'll show you. Where is it? Uh, here it is. No. No. Here it is. Where is it? Yeah, this is it. Look at this. They have these, and they have this broad color wheel uh, of like different colors of urine that would describe uh, things that were wrong with you. Clearly, if your urine is black, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll have to add that picture to this thing. Well, um, eventually, by 1665, things were getting a little bit out of hand with people drinking, smelling, swigging, swirling uh, urine, and 
this gentleman, Dr. Thomas Bryan, railed against the over-interpretation of urine uh, as being that uh, done by quacks in this, uh, a pro uh, in this pamphlet, this tract that he wrote, uh, 1665, 1655, called The Piss Prophet. Let me read it to you. Wherein are newly discovered the old fallacies, uh, deceit, and juggling of the piss pot science used by all those, whether quacks and empirics or other methodical physicians who pretend knowledge of, of diseases by, uh, by the urine in giving judgment of the same. So, anyways, yeah, he, he railed against uh, uroscopy and the interpretation of them. But they didn't stop some of these guys. Uh, here was, uh, it, before you think that uroscopy was a complete waste of time, it did lead to some interesting uh, advances. So this guy here is named Hennig Brunt. He was a uroscopist and an alchemist who was searching for the Philosopher's Stone. Does anybody here uh, know the Philosopher's Stone, right? So, uh, Harry Potter, yeah, right? The, the Philosopher's Stone, it's a real thing, or it's a real imagined thing, uh, which is a stone that would be able to confer immortality upon uh, the bearer of the stone and would also help them turn uh, lead into gold, right? So the Philosopher's Stone was rich and live forever, a pretty good thing to look for. Anyways, this guy, he was determined to find the Philosopher's Stone. and uh, the, But uroscopy was not actually a particularly lucrative field of uh, study. So he, but he needed a lab. And his strategy was to marry well. He married uh, a very uh, old and extremely wealthy woman. And she uh, promptly died. And then he married another very old and wealthy woman, and she also promptly died. So uh, he had the inheritance from these two uh, wealthy women, as well as each of uh, he now has two stepsons from their two, uh, those two marriages. He takes the dough and he builds a lab in his basement, and then sends his two stepsons out uh, to these uh, bars in. Um, so he was Flanders, this is Flemish, in Flanders. Uh, he sends his kids out to these bars to collect urine, uh, fresh urine from uh, beer drinkers at, at these uh, beer gardens. And goes on to collect uh, 1,500 gallons of urine. 1,500 gallons of urine. How big is an Olympic-sized pool? About like something on that order, like 1,500 gallons, a lot of pee, a huge amount of pee. And then his process uh, was he let that urine sit and putrefy in his, in his lab, his basement, for uh, something like six months or whatever. And then at that point, he decided it was a good idea to boil it down. And so then he began to uh, boil boil down this 1,500 gallons of urine, uh, putrid urine, until it got to this sort of honey consistency. And then he took this like honey urine stuff and he like flamed it a little bit more and it turned red. And there's this like long process. But at the end of it all, he got this glowing white mass uh, the size of like a, a golf ball, like glowing white mass. In fact, this was white phosphorus. He uh, isolated the phosphorus from a huge amount of human urine. Um, so uh, this was a, a real advance. It wasn't quite the Philosopher's Stones, but uh, yeah, his, his, his stepson's were like, what did we get ourselves into here? Um, it led to, so having this uh, phosphorus led to uh, matches. This is how uh, matches were first uh, invented, uh, which was the biggest commercial, uh, uh, immediate commercial 
uh, application of this. It also led to incendiaries, uh, so like uh, explosives, right, came out of this process. And eventually, uh, he sold the process to some other person in England who, uh, who continued, continued to extract the phosphorus out of urine for a while until they realized that you could just get it out of the ground. But yeah, urine, phosphorus, the P in, in phosphorus. Henning Brunt put the P in phosphorus. Uh, okay, let's step forward another 150 years or so. Uh, and more along the lines of uh, what Galen was doing, trying to understand the physiological role of the kidneys in, uh, in human disease, this guy Richard Bright, uh, who is a Scottish individual at uh, Ed in Edinburgh, uh, same place that those crazy dissection uh, slides that we have, the stereoscope slides. Uh, I should say this, that like Edinburgh for, for 200 years or so was really the uh, global center for anatomy, uh, anatomical and physiological studies in the world. It was really uh, the top. Well, anyways, uh, he uh, demonstrated the... Uh, the connection between proteinuria, that is the, at the occurrence of protein in your uh, urine, and what he called uh, dropsy. And dropsy is a condition uh, called, uh, th that we would call edema, or a, a severe swelling, uh, particularly in the lower extremity, uh, that is associated with kidney failure. Right? So this woman, something's wrong with her kidneys. She, who knows what happened uh, to her kidneys, but there's, the nephrons are breaking down, and uh, they are throwing protein into the urine, and the kidneys are just not working very well, so there's a huge fluid volume on the body. Uh, this, this kind of uh, dropsy uh, was called Bright's disease in, in honor of him for a, a long time, uh, even into the 20th century. Um, and this, his studies, uh, looking at the uh, urinalysis or the uh, analysis of, the con uh, of urine, the composition of urine and its correlation to various disease states, uh, set the groundwork for uh, what we now know as uh, nephrology, or the study of, of uh, kidney function. All right, so let's come into the 20th century. And this guy, Joseph Murray, this is kind of interesting. So um, early on, they realized the importance of the kidney, right? Uh, the kidney is really essential uh, to so many uh, functions in the body, uh, blood pressure and uh, uh, osmolarity, controlling osmolarity and pH and uh, fluid uh, balance. So uh, when people had kidney failure, what do you do, right? So the thought was, well, kidneys, the thing that's nice about a kidney is that uh, there's only a few things going into it. There's the renal artery, the renal vein, and the ureter. You can just like cut them and take a kidney from someone else and stitch them back in, and, every, and we're good to go. Um, and uh, it didn't work that way at first. So in 1909, they took uh, the, the kidneys of a pig, I believe, and uh, tried to stitch them into a human. And the, and the tissue was rejected, right? The human's uh, immune system was like, I don't know what that is, but it doesn't belong there. And it, it killed off that tissue. Um, I, didn't, I don't get to talk about the immune system here much, and maybe you already understand this, but every cell in your body has something called uh, an MHC, uh, major histocompatibility complex. It's basically a protein pedestal on the surface of that cell uh, that takes the like little samples of all the proteins that are in each of the cells in your body and puts them on the surface so that your immune system, which is constantly monitoring all the cells in your body, can know that this cell is native, right? But if it sees a cell that doesn't have MHC uh, that it recognizes, then it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to kill that because I don't know what it is. Um, right. 
That's called tissue rejection. In 1954, this uh, cheery fellow here, by all accounts, he was really a, a, a lovely uh, individual um, who was here in Boston. This is a, a local boy, uh, performed the first actually successful kidney transplant. And the way they got around this, uh, this problem of MHC was by uh, finding a, a pair of identical twins. They found a pair of identical twins, the Herrick twins. I don't know which is which, of course, but one of them uh, was in kidney failure. And so the kidneys are incredibly efficient organs. You actually only need like half of one kidney to really be fine. Um, so uh, he took, uh, Dr. Murray took one kidney out of the twin and stuck it into uh, his brother. And uh, it was completely successful. Uh, and because they were identical twins, they were genetically identical, the MHC between the two of them was identical. So uh, the one brother's immune system recognized the other brother's tissue as its own. All right, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, here they are looking at the first dialysis machine that was also uh, created by the same team under uh, Joseph Murray. So dialysis is like an artificial uh, kidney an artificial kidney that, that is not nearly as efficient or as effective, but uh, can, for a limited time, keep you uh, supported. So anyways, uh, then they, they did, uh, they went on to be able to do uh, kidney transplants using immunosuppressive therapy. So you can get a kidney from another person now and take, uh, you know, like steroids and immunosuppressive medicine, uh, and keep your own host immune system from destroying that kidney. Um, in the future, I imagine there's, there's going to be uh, ways of growing artificial kidneys uh, that completely match your own MHC, um, which that, that'll be pretty exciting uh, for. That'll revolutionize the whole concept of uh, organ transplant, like 3D printing. There are, there are labs at MIT that are working on like 3D printing organs right now. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay, so let's let's dive into the actual material here. Uh, here's the urinary system, and as I said, it's made of the kidneys, uh, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. Uh, and we'll, we always add. I was showing my my nine year old son was looking at over my shoulder as I was fiddling with these slides, and he's like, what? What's that goo that's on top of the kidneys there? And he's like, well, that's the suprarenal gland. And we will uh, talk about it a little bit, but not too much because it's really part of the endocrine system. So what does it do? Well, uh, primarily it's an excretory system, right? It's trying to excrete uh, fluid wastes out of the body, trying to get rid of uh, these excretions. So you remember, their secretions are the production of useful uh, cellular products from epithelial cells, and excretions are is the elimination of waste from epithelial cell wall surfaces. So the job of the urinary system is excretion and then elimination. Elimination means uh, you're, you're holding the fluid waste, but then you're eliminating it from the body. So that uh, seems trivial, but it, it is one of the aspects of the urinary system. Um, and then importantly, and this is where we're going to spend uh, a lot of our time, we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time on uh, excretion. I'm not going to talk about the micturition reflex, that is the urination reflex uh, and elimination at all. Although, although it's a pretty interesting reflex uh, how, how micturition actually works. I won't, you can do that somewhere else. But, uh, and then I'm going to switch to talking about uh, the homeostatic regulation of these sort of other functions of the urinary system. So managing blood volume, which is directly correlated to uh, blood pressure. Right, so as your blood volume goes up, your blood pressure goes up, and converse. Um, and this is through some the action of erythropoietin and renin. We'll talk about uh, renin. Uh, erythropoietin is a hormone that produces red blood cells, which also drives blood volume up. But I'm not going to talk about that at all. Uh, 
And then solute uh, concentration, which is under the control of a, a hormone called uh, calcitriol, which we did talk about uh, at the very first lecture of the semester, a little bit. Uh, it also helps to stabilize uh, the pH in the body by the excretion or retention of either uh, uh, hydrogen ion or carbonate, uh, depending on whether we need it more acidic or basic. And then lastly, uh, the uh, urinary system uh, detoxifies the blood. Truly, it detoxifies the blood by taking uh, whatever kind of strange chemical that you ate that you shouldn't have eaten and um, uh, trying to oxidize it in a way by you know, adding hydroxyl groups, alcohol groups onto it and making it more water-soluble uh, so that it can pass out uh, into the urine. Okay, so uh, the renal blood supply, I, I talked about how it, important it was to, to uh, go through this and understand it, uh, and so this, I won't recapitulate all of this stuff that uh, we already learned in lab, uh, we learned that whole pathway in lab, but I will point out uh, this, that um, about a quarter of the cardiac output uh, so 1,200 milliliters of blood per minute, uh, that's, that's more than a, a, a quart of milk uh, a minute is going through the kidneys. That's a huge uh, volume. That's a huge volume. Um, I guess I used to have a statistic up there. Uh, well, I might still have it. Well, I'll save it. I don't know. I don't really remember what's in this slideshow right now. Okay. So here is an overview of what's happening uh, in terms of excretion. And I'm, I'll go through this, and then we're going to take different regions of the nephron one at a time and talk about how each of them works, OK? Um, first, there's the nephron, and then there's the collecting system. And, and they both uh, have. Uh, independent and complementary functions. So uh, first part of the nephron is the renal corpuscle. We talked about that in lab today. And it has uh, the afferent the arteriole that's coming off of the uh, cortical radiate uh, artery. This afferent arteriole goes into the glomerulus and then emerges via the efferent arteriole. This is where filtration happens. Right, filtration of the blood, and we have this now what's called tubular fluid that passes into the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, the job of the proximal convo convoluted tubule is to get the baby out of the bathwater, uh, so to speak. So you've heard the term, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, that's kind of what happens when we filter the blood, this uh, tubular fluid that we create, it has you know, a lot of fluid in it, and it has some waste in it, but it also has some stuff we don't want to get rid of it in it, right? Because it's just filtering based on size. It's just a size exclusion filter. And so, like, glucose molecules that we don't want to lose, necessarily, or other nutrient molecules, or whatever, uh, that's in that tubular fluid, we want to get it back. And so that's the first thing that, that uh, the nephron does, is it tries to resorb... Uh, water, right, because you don't just lose a ton of water right at, one, all at once, uh, but ions and other organic nutrients like glucose, right? So a lot of salt, a lot of potassium, a lot of phosphate gets uh, lost in the filtration process, and it resorbs a lot of that right in the, in the proximal convoluted tubule. Then it goes into this, uh, this loop of Henle, the nephron loop, and uh, the, the job of the nephron loop, uh, by and large, is to concentrate the urine. And it, it does that by, uh, by so here's a, a general principle of the kidney. And, and like just a general physical principle of biology. Um, water follows the salt. Water follows the sodium. All right, and so the way the loop of Henle is going to work is it's going to pull sodium out of the uh, tubular fluid actively 
and by you know, using ATP, it's going to pump sodium out, and then the water is going to follow that. All right. So in general, water follows the salt. It's it, by creating osmotic pressure gradients. Is that do those words good with everybody? Yeah, osmotic. Is, that concept is cool. Yeah. So yeah, I, osmotic pressure just means when you have uh, salt, something like a salt water and fresh water, and if you separate them by a membrane that doesn't allow the salt to pass but does allow the water to pass, the water will go uh, down its uh, con the, the concentration gradient so that the, where all that salt is will become less salty and the water uh, will travel towards that to dilute that salty water. Okay. That's all osmosis means. After the nephron loop, we get to the distal convoluted tubule. And this is where we start fine-tuning things, like tweaking stuff. Um, so maybe actually we need to get rid of some ions that we have too much of. All right, So we start doing a lot of active processes. We're going to start actively secreting some kind of ions. We're going to actively secrete... Uh, some toxins maybe that are in there that we don't, uh, that didn't get filtered out. But we're going to like, this is it, right? We've like filtered, we've gotten the good stuff back, uh, we've concentrated. Now let's like tweak it and get it just where we want it. Uh, and, that, and that happens in the distal convoluted tubule. The distal convoluted tubule in particular is very susceptible to, it's, it's like, very susceptible to change. So meaning that like uh, different hormones, and we're going to talk about those hormones in a bit, but they're going to be able to affect uh, variably how much is getting resorbed or secreted or whatever. So the, like the actual moment-to-moment -moment function of the distal convoluted tubule can change uh, quite, quite a bit. Does that make sense? And then lastly is uh, the collecting duct and the papillary duct. And so um, and the, the collecting duct is able to change that composition of the urine. It really is the last place that this happens. Um, and again, much like the distal convoluted tubule, it can have like a variable uh, ability to resorb certain ions or water. Um, yeah, and the, the collecting uh, duct in particular is where we tend to adjust the pH of uh, the urine. All right, so that's that's the overview, and we'll we'll look at this in a little more detail in a bit here. So let's just get a sense of the renal corpuscle. Um, I guess this is the afferent arterial, and here we just see this crazy little knot of capillaries, and it's, it's quite small. It's only uh, 250 micrometers uh, in diameter. So that means uh, if you look at your thumbnail, the thickness of your thumbnail is a millimeter, all right? So you could fit four of them in that space, right? Four of the largest of them, anywhere from four to six of them uh, would fit end to end across the thickness of your thumbnail, just to get a sense of, of the size of these things. Pretty beautiful little structures. Okay, here's a, a cartoon. Um, and we can see here that uh, afferent arterial is larger than the efferent arterial. Uh, blood comes in, goes through this uh, knot of capillaries, and then the blood comes out. And fluid gets filtered out through these slits here and passes out. This is now called tubular fluid. This is what's going to become urine. It's going to become the urine. Uh, but it passes out into this proximal convoluted tubule. Why do you think the afferent arterial is larger than the efferent arterial? Yeah, the volume's going down, right? We're we're pulling we're pulling fluid off the blood, all right. And so uh, this is this is a lower 
it's, it's a smaller diameter, because if it was the same diameter, there'd be a radical pressure drop. And we don't want that radical pressure drop. We want to maintain the pressure uh, coming uh, through this. And if we're losing volume, we got to restrict uh, the, the diameter of the thing coming out of it. Very good. OK. So um, we talked about the, uh, the capillary epithelium, the epithelial cells that make, uh, or endothelial cells that make the, uh, that make up the capillaries. That endothelial, uh, that endothelium is a special kind of endothelium. Uh, it's called fenestrated. It's fenestrated uh, endothelium, meaning that uh, it has a bunch of little holes or pores in it. Uh, I guess I don't even have the word fenestrated on my slide. I suppose I should put it up there. Fenestre. Uh, uh, is French for window, and so it just a fenestr anything that's fenestrated has little windows in them or pores. Um, fenestrated epithelium, uh, and and that's going to be part of this filtration process. The second layer of filtration, the second filter on here, is uh, made by these uh, podocytes. The podocytes are uh, the cells that I said looked like my hands. With the, with the uh, pedicels that are coming off of them that interdigitate uh, amongst one another and create these, uh, create these filtration slits uh, that you can see right here. So uh, the red that you see, this red striping, is really just the gap. It's the endothelium that you can see beneath it, uh, beneath the podocytes that is part of the capillaries. They're just the filtration slits. Uh, that are lying between the two uh, cells. Now, when you have adjacent, when you have adjacent uh, capillaries like this, in between them, there's going to be this kind of cell called the mesangial cell. Um, mesangial cells are going to be cells that are responsive to hormones produced at the juxtaglomerular complex, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, but that's to remind you that's this area right here. Remember, we have the uh, afferent and efferent arterioles. This is that loop of the, the, uh, the, the part of the, the distal convoluted tubule that's going to run adjacent to these two. And then there's these juxtaglomerular cells that are right next to the macula densa. All of this area right here becomes the juxtaglomerular <coughs> complex. This is like quality control central, right? This is a, it's like a monitoring station. It's comparing the quality of the blood coming in to the, at this point, fairly close to what is urine at the far end of the distal convoluted tubule, right? It's like seeing what's coming in and comparing it to what's going out. And these cells are going to be reactive to that and produce hormones that are going to do a, a number of things. Uh, one of them is to affect these mesangial cells. And so what mesangial cells do is they can contract and change the diameter, uh, change the diameter of these epithelial cells by kind of pinching uh, down on them. And by in so doing, raising the blood pressure in those capillaries in the glomerulus, and if you raise the pressure, you're going to force more fluid out, right? You're going to be driving that fluid uh, filtration pressure. It's sort of like you have a ho garden hose uh, with no spigot on it, and you just like put your thumb over it and, and like narrow the opening, and the, and the filter, the water starts coming faster. All right. So uh, a bunch of these pictures are just sort of uh, driving the same concept. So we have, uh, here's the blood in a capillary. Here's the capsular space. This would be like the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, and here are these filtration slits and the fenestrated pores. Uh, small molecules and water can all pass through, but large proteins and obviously red blood cells are not going to pass through these. 
you can, you can see how someone with Bright's disease uh, or glomerular nephritis, as it's uh, now called, uh, might have some sort of damage to this, uh, this structure. And you can begin to have proteins pass through these holes. And protein will then begin to appear in the urine. All right? So uh, the filtration pressure is about 10 millimeters of mercury. And we're going to like break that down uh, in a bit. Uh, to see how that we get that number. But, uh, here's just a, a close-up. So we have the, the fenestrations here in, in this uh, epithelium, and then the pedicels uh, with their filtration slits in between. And the solutes can just pass right uh, through there, the small solutes, small molecules. Just a filter. That's all it is. It's a filter. Um, okay. So... I don't know how the hell you get a picture like that, but they took it. Uh, it's a scanning electron micrograph of uh, glomerulus. And you can see here, the, so this would be a podocyte. This is a podocyte. These are all podocytes that are laying on top of the uh, capillary uh, endothelium. And then the pedicels that are lay, extensions of those cells laying next to one another with all their filtration slits uh, in the kidneys. Okay, so uh, this is the, the forces that are involved in this glomerular uh, filtration. So um, there's the, the blood uh, hydrostatic pressure that's going out. And, you know, that's about, at this point, uh, in, the, in the arterial chain, that's about 60 millimeters of mercury. So your arterial blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure for pretty much everyone in the room is probably going to be between, like, 75 on the low end up to maybe 100. Somewhere in there is probably the maps that are in the class, maybe a little bit higher, um, you know. Uh, so, but as you get into the capillary beds, it goes down a little bit, and so that blood hydrostatic pressure is about 60 millimeters of mercury, going from the capillaries out in the capsular space. But uh, there's a couple things that are working in the opposite direction. So the capsular pressure, the pressure of the, cap the tubular fluid that you've just produced, is about 18 or 20 millimeters of mercury. That's pushing in the other direction, right? So that's, it has to work against that. The blood has to work against that. Just like the heart has to work against your uh, aortic pressure to eject its blood. Uh, and then there's this colloid osmotic pressure. Uh, and this is often the hardest one for students to understand. But uh, there's the osmotic pressure, just like I described osmosis a moment ago, where you have a membrane and you have two solutions on either side, and one of them has a much higher concentration of some solute, well, the fluid that has a lower concentration, it's going to go in the direction of the higher concentration. All right? And um, the blood, so a colloid is, like milk is a colloid, blood is a colloid. Colloid is just where you have, oops, geez, where's the picture I want? Jeez, Ooh, here we are. Uh, it's where you have these like plasma proteins that are in suspension. These plasma proteins are, are, are colloids up in suspension. They're not able to pass. And because of this, there's a higher concentration of these plasma proteins that's going to draw water back into the blood, right? So that's the colloid osmotic pressure. Um, nothing you can do about that. That's uh, about 30 millimeters of mercury going back into the blood. Uh, luckily, the blood pressure is high enough so that there's a net of about 10 millimeters of mercury pushing fluid out into the tubular fluid. That's how we get to the, the 10 millimeters of mercury. All right. So that number goes up, of course, as your, your blood pressure goes up. Uh, kidneys, in particular, are susceptible to high blood pressure. So that picture I showed you of... Uh, of uh, Robert Bright and the woman with dropsy, 
That's, that woman was probably just hypertensive. She probably ate too much salt in her life or whatever, had high blood pressure, and it destroyed her kidneys, sent her into kidney failure. So uh, if you have chronic high blood pressure, you get this nephrosclerosis, pretty nasty, pretty nasty. Um, you begin to rupture the glomerular uh, capsule and, and, and membranes, the capillaries. Uh, they, they get this like scarring. And uh, also high blood pressure leads to atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries and the renal arteries as well. Uh, and you get uh, renal failure, which is not good. Okay, so we're going to talk now about how the kidney controls glomerular filtration rate, like that rate. So I just showed you the forces that are giving us the, the pressure, right, that, that uh, 10 millimeters of mercury. And there's, there's three ways uh, that it gets regulated. There's going to be auto-regulation uh, that happens at the local level. Um, and then there's going to be some hormonal regulation that is initiated by the kidneys. And then the sympathetic nervous system will uh, send in some autonomic uh, nerves that will also con control that. Those are the, the three ways. We're going to unpack some of that um, in, the, in the coming slides here. Any questions so far before I... <clears throat> Dive, dive in. Everybody is good? Let's scribble, scribble. Smiling, good. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the endocrine method, that, that hormonal uh, control method that is initiated at the kidneys. It, it all starts at the juxtaglomerular complex. Um, so I said there were two proteins that uh, are going to be produced here. The first is called erythropoietin. Um, and this hormone, the, the job of erythropoietin, uh, it, it's going to get dumped into the blood. All right? uh, it's, pro it's produced by these juxtaglomerular cells and gets dumped into the blood that's leaving via the efferent arteriole. And what happens uh, is uh, these cells are monitoring this blood, and they say, oh, wow, the oxygen level is low in the blood. For some reason, it's just a low oxygen level. Uh, and that's what stimulates these cells to produce erythropoietin. As soon as erythropoietin uh, hits the bloodstream, it goes to your spleen, it goes to your red bone marrow, uh, and it causes cells in that tissue to produce red blood cells. And we, what, what is that going to do? We learned about that yesterday, right? It's going to be more blood cells, like 280 billion molecules of hemoglobin per uh, red blood cell. So that means um, roughly 1 trillion molecules of oxygen per red blood cell. Uh, and as you make more red blood cells that's actually going to increase your blood volume. Not the liquid part, the solid part. But it will increase uh, the blood pressure a little bit. Now, this other protein that's made here is called renin. <coughs> renin elevates the blood pressure, but by affecting the fluid component of the blood. The fluid component. All right? And we're, we're going to see how that works uh, next. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on that. Okay. So, <clears throat> this is the response that you see. So often, um, in, in any homeostatic system, there's like some, we know there's a variable, right, that's getting monitored. I said that from the first day. There's some variable that we're looking at, that we're going to be monitoring and trying to keep it within a range. Sometimes it goes above and sometimes it goes below. And often we have two different mechanisms for addressing if it goes above versus if it goes below, like in our body temperature. If I get cold, if it goes down, I start to shiver and whatever happens. If I get hot, I start to sweat, right? Two different homeostatic pathways. 
So this is the pathway uh, that we have in response to an increase in the glomerular filtration rate. So that, that filtration rate goes up. Uh, we're, we're comparing tubular fluid in the distal convoluted tubule to the glomerulus, and we notice that there's, there's some kind of problem. There's something outside of the normal range where uh, we have an increase in the GFR. So what happens? That we uh, see an increase in that. That's going to lead to an increase in the filtrate and the urine production. Uh, as sensed by the macula densa. And the macula densa, then uh, it's paracrine tissue. So it's going to make a bunch of, uh, it's going to make a bunch of hormone that it's going, that's going to affect tissue right next to it. There, there's paracrine cells that are going to affect tissue right around it. Remember there was autocrine, that's cells that, that affect themselves with the hormone. Paracrine are uh, cells that make hormones that affect their nearest neighbor without using the bloodstream. And then endocrine are cells that dump the hormone into the blood, right? So there's some paracrine secretion that happens here that's going to do a number of things. It's going to affect the mesangial cells and lead to a, a, um, a contraction of the mesangial cells that's going to... Uh, uh, also lead to a constriction of the afferent arterioles. Yeah, uh, a constriction of the afferent arterioles. So we're limiting the blood uh, that's coming into the arf uh, afferent arterioles, and then we're dilating the efferent arterioles. So we're minimizing that pressure differential between what's coming in and, and going out. All right. We were keeping that pressure differential and the size coming in and going out as a way to keep pressure up. Uh, in, in the glomerulus. That's going to reduce the glomerular uh, blood pressure and then uh, restore GFR. On the other hand, uh, it's, just, it's just the opposite here. If GFR drops, we have uh, a consequent drop in filtrate and urine production, uh, and that will lead to a dilation of the afferent arterioles and a constriction of the efferent arterioles. Bringing glomerular blood pressure up and restoring homeostasis. So um, let's, let's look at a little bit of the numbers around this. Um, we have, so your glomerular filtration rate, your kidneys, uh, filter out about 125 milliliters per minute. That's a little, like a little juice glass, a little sm a small, like juice glass volume of filtrate uh, per minute. That leads to about 180 liters per day. Woo! 180 liters per day. That's like that's like a Pretty big size barrel that's larger than your body, right? Um, so, if all of that fluid became urine, there would be nothing left to you within a short order. You wouldn't make it more than an hour or two uh, if you lost all of that fluid at, at that at that actual rate. So, 99% of that is going to get reabsorbed in, by the renal tubes. Okay, uh, the Proximal, distal, uh, and the loop of Henle, all that stuff. Um, about 10% of the fluid that enters the kidney leaves uh, the bloodstream as uh, tubular fluid into the capsular space. So fairly efficient process all around here. Talking about, the, so that's a lot of fluid that's getting filtered out, right? And we're going to move from the capsular space, and we're going to begin to consider uh, these tubes, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and how to affect that fluid going through the nephron. Um, considering water balance and resorption of water, you have to consider sodium and potassium at the same time. Like I said, water follows the salt. Whatever, wherever the salt's moving, the water's going to follow it, all right? So when we're thinking about 
sodium, potassium, and water homeostasis, like the resorption or uh, release of this stuff, there's going to be uh, two aspects. The first are these molecular factors. Um, and these are the three categories of molecular factors that are going to be important. I'm just naming them, and then I'm going to like, show you how they connect one to one another in the next couple slides. Um, the major hormones, so as you're looking through the slides, some of these slides I've moved around. Some of them are, are new slides. There's no new material. It's just like I'm kind of expanding <coughs> my description of them, so I, I apologize for that. Uh, the major hormones... There's three major hormones, angiotensin, aldosterone, uh, and antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. There is a host of minor hormones, and I'm not going to get to talk about all of these. I won't talk about all of these. I'll talk about a few of these, uh, but I, I won't talk about most of them. Uh, but I will talk about all three of those in, in detail. Uh, and then there's a bunch of enzymes that are important, uh, ren renin and angiotensin-converting enzyme. Uh, so the, both of these enzymes are going to relate to the function of these hormones, uh, and we'll see uh, what happens with them uh, in a bit. So then the other part of it are systemic factors. So I showed you the, the cast of characters. We're going to see what plays out with them in a bit, but that was the cast of molecular characters. These are some systemic factors uh, to consider. So uh, there's, first of all, the GI system, and that's how, much, how we're getting water on board, right? So we can absorb some water through uh, the GI tract, and, and that's where... That's where we get it, right? All the water comes in through the GI. And, and some of it does get secreted into the GI tract too, right? We have to, so we absorb water in the stomach and then we like dump water in uh, to the system through the, the, the intestines and then in the GI. Uh, in, in the colon, we absorb a lot of that water. We just need to like turn everything we eat into a fluid mush and then when it gets into the colon, we take that fluid back out. And so uh, we, we, there's a net absorption of water in the GI tract. Um, and then there's uh, the intracellular space. So I showed you the fluid compartments in the body in the cardiovascular unit. A lot of water uh, exists inside the cells of all, of our, uh, all the cells in our body. And there are going to be shifts in uh, the proteins that are on the membranes of those cells that are going to uh, affect how much water is coming in or going out of the cell and what sodium that's passing in and out and potassium is passing in and out of the cells. We've seen a little bit of that already with um, like neuronal function, how sodium and potassium are you know, going in and out of the cell. Uh, but there's, there's other aspects of that in non- um, in non-excitatory cells. Uh, then there's the renal system. So there's filtration we've already talked about, uh, and that's removing water from uh, the pool of body fluids. And then there's also resorption, right? And there's going to be a balance between the two of those. Lastly, there is the endocrine system, which is going to be the kind of control system that's mediating uh, a lot of the effects that we're going to see throughout these tissues, okay? So just like um, calcium homeostasis, we said absorption happens in the GI tract, uh, elimination happens in the kidneys, and storage is in the bones. It's the same with all these fluids and sodium, except storage is, is in every cell in your body, if you want to think of it like that. Does that make sense? and then controlled by uh, hormones from the endocrine system, the pituitary and the suprarenal gland. Okay. Um, yeah, this is, and that last part with the endocrine system and control, that's this, these hormones. There are two other levels of, of control, the nervous system and uh, so with the CNS, uh, and then the, the PNS as well. Uh, but then there's, uh, there's also uh, autoregulation that, that happens 
uh, it's tissue specific and is locally controlled. We're going to focus on the hormones, which is why I have that uh, highlighted there. So that's, that's plenty to absorb. Okay, before I move on, you need to understand this concept of an axis. Uh, there are these, so an axis is a, a sequential set of uh, various factors that uh, are part of the feed mechanism, a feedback mechanism that are going to connect some sort of endocrine organ to the target organ. All right, so there's an axis that connects uh, like various endocrine tissues to the downstream uh, tissue that we're trying to regulate. That's an axis. Um, and for blood pressure, there's two homeostatic axes. There's the RAA axis and the HPA axis. The renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, and then the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, and we're going to go through those. I'm going to show you what those are. Those are the cast of characters that I introduced. I'm going to show you how they relate to one another in these two axes of control. Who's with me? Yep, everyone? Sort of? Have I lost you? you? You good? Okay. So first let's do the RAA axis. Um, you guys, you don't have these slides, I'm sorry, but you have uh, like a simpler overview slide and I, and I take it, and I, or you have maybe a more complex overview slide and I break it down into... Uh, smaller bites that we're going to go through, uh, but has a little more detail in it. So um, what happens? Well, we're going to have a drop in the, in the blood pressure at the glomerulus. Why? Maybe we cut ourselves and we bled a little bit. There's a drop in the blood volume or our uh, systemic blood pressure goes down for some reason. Maybe there's a renal artery blockage. Who knows? A number of things can reduce the blood pressure at the glomerulus. Um, or there's a drop in the osmotic concentration of the tubular fluid as sensed by the macula densa. So all any of those conditions are going to stimulate the production of renin. You remember that renin is one of the two enzymes that I said were the molecular factors that had hormones, major hormones, minor hormones, and enzymes. The two enzymes were renin and ACE. So renin gets produced, and the job of renin, which is produced at the macula densa, is to take this protein called angiotensinogen that's produced in the liver. Uh, what did I say? Any protein that has the, the uh, suffix uh, inogen on it, ogen, did I say that? I feel like I did. You remember? It's not finished. It's, not finished. it's a proenzyme, which doesn't mean professional. Uh, it means uh, not fully active yet. It's not active. It's going to become active. It gets uh, so angiotensinogen is a is a proenzyme or, or preenzyme is the way you can think of it. It's not actually. It doesn't have a function yet. It's not doing anything. Uh, it's 453 amino acids long. Renin is an enzyme that is going to cleave most of that off. And it's going to leave behind 10 amino acids. That's the functional bit. Only 10 amino acids in this giant mess uh, are, are actually uh, active. So angiotensin uh, 1 is going to get acted on by a second enzyme, angiotensin-converting enzyme, ACE, another enzyme that's going to cleave two more regulatory amino acids off of uh, angiotensin-1. And that's going to give us angiotensin-2. Okay, So all of this was just getting us to the point of having the hormone that's actually going to do what we want it to do. All right. So this is a pro-hormone, this is also a pro-hormone, uh, and then we have angiotensin II, which is just a little piece, that's a peptide, really, and that's going to be what does what we want. Okay, 
can you see how this is an axis, like a, a like a step by step a homeostatic process that's connecting uh, endocrine tissue, specifically at the juxtaglomerular complex, with uh, downstream effects at the tissue that we're interested in. So angiotensin II uh, is circulating in the blood, and that is going to stimulate um, the production of aldosterone. So there are these steroid precursors, hormone precursors that are in the uh, the epinephrine, uh, the, the suprarenal gland, uh, that are going to be subject to angiotensin II, convert that to aldosterone, and aldosterone is going to have an effect on the kidney. Uh, it's going to cause aldosterone causes the kidney to save its sodium and water. So it's it's really sodium. It's going to cause the retention of sodium or the reabsorption of sodium, and water is going to follow it. All right. So it's pulling water, pulling sodium back uh, in, and that is going to elevate the blood volume and thereby the blood pressure. Okay? So, I mean, the, the real rubber meets the road here when aldosterone is acting in the kidney to just make us resorb sodium. That's, that's really it, right? But how do we get down there? We have this proenzyme that's being affected by renin. So renin is, is the thing that trips the set of dominoes, right? Renin is produced by the, by the macula densa, or the juxtaglomerular complex, uh, to, and causes the set of dominoes that ends up in the production of aldosterone, which is going to have us resorb sodium, and thus water, and raise the blood pressure. Okay. So now, get ready. I'm going to add some more. Yeah. <laughs> it took me a little while to make this slide. So uh, there's a, it's a little more sophisticated than that as well. Angiotensin does, uh, angiotensin 2 does a bunch of other things. It also turns on the sympathetic nervous system. It uh, stimulates the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to stimulate the pituitary gland, uh, which is going to cause the production of ADH. ADH is going to have the same effect as aldosterone. It's going to cause sodium and water retention. Meanwhile, the hypothalamus is going to uh, initiate the sensation of thirst. You're going to get thirsty. You're going to go and grab a glass of water, tall, cold, fresh. Water, yum, so refreshing. I feel it going in. Uh, drink it and elevate your blood volume and pressure. Um, and then lastly, angiotensin II, the name, so look at the name, angio, meaning arteries, right? Uh, tensin, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tense them up. It's going to take your arteries and lead to vasoconstriction, so those uh the, the blood vessels are going to constrict and reduce the actual physical space of, uh, that the blood is in and thereby increase blood pressure. Right? So angiotensin II has a lot of different mechanisms. There's uh, all this stuff. Well, there's the, the method through aldosterone. There's a pathway through the sympathetic nervous system, which we're not even going to really touch. There's uh, activities through the hypothalamus, which is thirst and drinking, and through the pituitary, which leads to ADH, and then direct effects on uh, the circulatory system. So angiotensin II is a pretty powerful molecule, and you can see why it's good to have it as an endocrine uh, hormone, because uh, systemically, because it's affecting all kinds of aspects uh, related to blood pressure. So initially, back when I was here, you may be thinking, well, why does renin have to be, why, why is all this in the bloodstream? Renin started at the kidney and aldosterone works at the kidney. Why can't we just keep it at the kidney? Uh, it's because there are a lot of other components, oops, to increase blood pressure that are being, um, that are being invoked. Okay. So here is, uh, we're going to zoom in a little bit to the effects uh, that are actually happening right at the nephron from some of these hormones. 
I said angiotensin uh, 2 causes the resorption of sodium. Uh, this, this is at the proximal convoluted tubule. This, uh, to, to keep it um, so that it's at a charge neutrality, uh, it also resorbs carbonate. Um, and then uh, aldosterone, uh, its primary effect is along the uh, late distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, where it's going to have a sodium potassium antiporter. All right. Uh, so again, keeping a charge neutrality, it pulls sodium in and, and pushes potassium out. Uh, but then it uh, is able, it's able to uh, get that potassium back by using a uh, hydrogen ion potassium antiporter. So the net effect here is that we uh, resorb sodium and pump hydrogen ion out. We just switch. Uh, we, we acidify the urine and keep charge neutrality by resorbing uh, sodium. Uh, oh, and then, yeah, renin. You see uh, the effect of renin there where it's getting produced by the juxtaclomerular complex and entering the blood. Uh, so the, the sort of like flow here has the, the perfusion pressure, the blood pressure at the kidney is low. This, this stimulates the secretion of renin, which in that, in that compli complicated slide last time I showed how it, we get a production of angiotensin II, uh, which leads to the production of aldosterone. Uh, this increases sodium resorption. Water follows the sodium. Blood pressure follows the water. Uh, and then it also increases the serum pH, right? It increases serum pH by uh, pulling in carbonate and by pushing out hydrogen ion, all right? So it alkalizes the blood. All This whole sequence alkalizes the blood. RAA axis. That's the RAA axis kind of like the sophisticated core concept of, of the day. Who needs a two-minute break? Yeah, OK, so let's, let's, take, let's take a couple minutes. We're going to start walking through the sections in a little bit more, um, with a little bit closer uh, view to them. Uh, first is the proximal convoluted tubule. And, and you see all these pathways here uh, where we're absorbing all this, resorbing all this stuff, right? So here's the tubular fluid. We're resorbing glucose, right? It's one of the small molecules that's getting resorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule. We're resorbing sodium, right? And if there's sodium, water's going to follow. Uh, and we're, you, we're excreting, we're exporting hydrogen ions. We're uh, uh, also absorbing carbonate. The point that uh, I, I want to drive with this slide is not get you to memorize all the details of all of this, but to note that all of these processes Everything that's happening here, uh, that sodium is involved in all of it. So sodium is a co-transporter with glucose. Uh, sodium is, a, is an anti-transporter with hydrogen ion. And, uh, and sodium is co-transporting with the carbonate. So all of the... Uh, all of the functions of the... Uh, proximal convoluted tubule are dependent upon that resorption of sodium. It's, uh, it's underlying uh, everything. All right. There is, here are some definitions that we need to talk about uh, when we talk about these proteins that are moving things in or moving things out. It's the idea of a transport maximum and a renal threshold. So a transport mac uh, maximum is the max rate that something can be either secreted or uh, excreted, or resor uh, so either resorbed or put into the tubular fluid 
uh, by the renal, uh, renal tubules. Um, so for example, uh, here is some protein, this black wheel there is meant to represent some sort of a protein. Here's our tubular fluid and the little black dots are some kind of solute, whether it's uh, glucose or whatever, sodium something. Uh, <clears throat> and each of the little cogs uh, on that wheel there is uh, sort of the active ability of that transport molecule to transport one of the solutes. So in the first panel, it's below the transport maximum. You can see there are like open sites as it's transporting stuff uh, in the urine, uh, out of the urine. When you're at the transport maximum, that's the concentration of that solute that uh, the proteins that are tra the transporter proteins are saturated. They're they're at their max capacity. If the concentration of that solute goes beyond that transport maximum, then the protein transporters are unable to transport enough things and some stuff is going to get through, okay? Um, <clears throat> so this uh, renal threshold, this relates to the idea of renal threshold. Uh, it's the concentration of a solute in the plasma that, uh, at which that solute begins to appear in the urine. Beyond that, that uh, concentration, you're going to see that solute in the urine. So this is going to change with uh, one, one substance to another, right? Because each of these different substances are going to have unique transporters that are going to resorb them, all right? Uh, glucose, that, uh, that transport, uh, that renal threshold is actually quite high. It's actually quite high. We don't, you don't want to lose sugar, right? Because it's like we worked so hard to get it. Um, so the, the renal threshold is, is quite high and there's a fairly high transport maximum. So the, the glucose transporters in the proximal convoluted tubule, there's a lot of them and it's hard to saturate them. That number for glucose is 180 milligrams per deciliter. If you have uh, sugar, if you go beyond a blood sugar of 180 milligrams per deciliter, you're going to have sugar in your urine. Uh, this can be indicative of, of diabetes mellitus, so super high blood sugar inability of the body to, um, so either like insulin resistance or inability to produce insulin depending on whether you're type 1 or 2, uh, diabetes mellitus. Um, right. Amino acids, on the other hand, have a much lower renal threshold. Eh, amino acids, they're not as crucial, right? And so if you have too much, amino, too many amino acids in your blood, you can just, you, you let them pass out. Um, and so it's fairly common if you eat a really high protein diet. So for example, if you're on like the Atkins diet or something like that, it's, it's pretty frequent uh, to be able to see a lot of amino acids in the urine. And this leads to something called amino acid urea. Um, people who have, who eat Nothing but proteins uh, are in chronic amino aciduria, and this can actually lead to uh, to kidney problems if it's a if it's a consistent problem. Um, and then, th so this diagram, if you want to read about it, it's in Netter right there. Uh, naturesis is the process of. So I said diuresis was the process of eliminating water. Um, Naturesis is the process of eliminating sodium. So it's sodium secretion in the urine. It's a couple definitions. A couple definitions for you. All right, on to the nephron loop, or the loop of Henle. So it's pretty amazing how this thing works. Uh, to remind you, there's the thin limb and the thick limb. Um, and the thin limb, the job of the thin limb is uh, it's impermeable to solutes. So this red on here means that uh, sodium can't pass 
through there, or whatever, anything. The only thing that can pass is water. And if you look at the concentration of the tubular fluid, as it goes down, that concentration uh, goes up, right? So water is coming out because it's, there's a concentration gradient of solute in the tissue surrounding it, all right? And this water is going down its osmotic gradient. Uh, the question is, how do we get this concentration gradient? Well, uh, we, we create the concentration gradient in the ascending limb. The ascending limb uses active transport. It's going to burn ATP. It all, the whole thing comes from ATP. Uh, it burns ATP and pumps sodium chloride out into, uh, sodium chloride out into the extracellular space. Uh, along the medulla, right? So this is those long limbs that go down into the medulla of the, of the nephron. And it creates this salty concentration gradient where it's really salty down here and it's not so salty up here. Uh, the ATP we burn to pump sodium out and create this concentration gradient is what passively draws the water out. Remember, water follows the salt. Yeah? And we call that countercurrent multiplication. And it's countercurrent because uh, water's coming down in this direction and, and going up. And so there's like these countercurrents, and uh, there's like this multiplicative concentration gradient that's, that's created. That's where the name comes from. All right. So this is a super efficient thing. This takes like 80, 85% of the water. Uh, off uh, the between the proximal and the distal convoluted tubules. It's it's the primary way that we like resorb water and sodium. All right, more definitions. I've used this word already, but micturition is the uh, it's equivalent to the word urination. So micturition uh, is simply the the normal elimination of urine from the urinary bladder. Uh, diuresis is the broader process of pulling fluid out of your whole system um, via, via the urine, of course. So when you say diuresis, you're typically indicating a process that's removing a lot of fluid from uh, the body. There are a category of chemicals uh, called diuretics. Yeah, you probably heard of diuretics before. Uh, they are chemicals that promote water loss through micturition. Um, and having a diuretic is going to do a couple things. It's going to reduce blood volume and thereby reduce blood pressure. Uh, it's also going to pull water off of the extracellular fluid, all right? So say, you, yeah, um, yeah, I, 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 we're not going to say. Uh, so yeah, extracellular fluid volume is going to be drawn into the blood, and blood will be drawn into the urine. Uh, blood volume and pressure goes down. So there are uh, a lot of different types of diuretics. Uh, so for example, uh, furosemide, uh, is that how you say that? Furosemide is a loop diuretic. It's going to affect, specifically affect, uh, the function at the nephron loop. Uh, Torsamid is another uh, one in that uh, different chemical uh, category in that same uh, part of the nephron. And then uh, here's uh, spironolactone. This uh, sort of cholesterol derivative is... Um, an aldosterone agonist, meaning it, it mimics uh, aldosterone and in, in the effects that aldosterone has in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay. So, uh, water balance. In general, in general, like blood pressure and everything uh, being equal, the water that you drink in a day should be the water that you urinate. Uh, in the day, uh, and, or uh, exhale through uh, your breath or is evaporated off through the skin. 
So blood comes in through the GI tract, um, and uh, so this is where the water is entering, and there's usually a, like no net resorption or uh, filtration uh, balance here, uh, but then we lose some water to urine and some uh, through the lungs and the skin. So the way that our body is able, this right here, we don't really control this. We can't really control this. So if we need to conserve water, uh, we conserve water by making the urine more concentrated. If we need to eliminate water, uh, we do that by making the, the urine more dilute. All right. So <clears throat> by independently controlling water and sodium retention or elimination, you can defend against a host of possible disturbances that might happen to the body uh, in in the bodily fluids. So let's just look at some of these possible things that can happen to you. Maybe you are um, maybe you are dehydrated. So that means your blood volume, uh, your your water volume has gone down. You're dehydrated. That also means that your osmolarity or the sodium concentration in the blood has gone up. It's just like having a glass of water that's got salt in it. If you, if you boil some of that water off, the salt water is going to become more concentrated. So that's dehydration. Uh, whereas blood loss is going to decrease the, the water on board, but also the salt, because you're losing the salt with the water. That's like pouring some water out of the cup rather than, than boiling some off. Uh, or you can ingest salt. So if you like go, uh, if you're going to watch the Patriots or whatever, and you like toss down a whole bunch of salty peanuts, you are bringing a bunch of salt into the body. What is that going to do? It's going to make you thirsty. Uh, and so you're going to reach for a can of Coca-Cola. Uh, why not? And you drink that. But then the Coca-Cola has as much salt in it as two pieces of pizza. What? It's true. Uh, there's a huge amount of salt in a can of Coca-Cola. Look on the label sometime. And so there's more salt, and you're, like, thirstier. So you're going to, like, bring a bunch of more fluid on board, right? And so you're well, – that's why there's a star next to this. So you're eating something salty and, of course, increasing the osmolarity, but it's going to incre – it's going to make you thirsty. So you're going to bring uh, water on as well, and it's going to increase your blood volume. Or maybe – you just like to drink pure water. My son, when he wakes up first thing in the morning before he can even open his eyes, he sort of like staggers into the kitchen, and I was like, water. He asks for a cup of water. It's really dry in the dorm downtown. And so we like pour him a big glass, and like he slugs it down, and then like slugs another one down, and then <sighs> wakes up. Uh, but what is that doing? That's going to increase his blood volume, but it's going to decrease the salt concentration uh, in, his, in his blood. So there's all these, these different uh, things that can happen so that your, your water volume and your salt volume do move independently from one another. And these are the hormones uh, that, that can affect uh, these things. So if you have a de decrease in blood volume, Anti or water volume, antidiuretic hormone is going to be the, the hormone that uh, controls that. Uh, angiotensin also is going to uh, lead, uh, is going to uh, help respond to a decrease in water volume. Whereas we didn't talk about atrial uh, natriuretic hormone and, and brain natriuretic hormone, um, I just showed them as a list of minor hormones. But these would be uh, the hormones that respond to an increase in water volume. Conversely, uh, if you have too much, uh, if, if you're losing too much salt, aldosterone will help you resorb sodium. So we saw that already. This is these three we've already seen. Antidiuretic hormone. We well, we haven't really seen antidiuretic hormone that much. But antidiuretic hormone is going to respond to an increase in uh, in salt. 
So antidiuretic hormone would be what? It would be the best to use in this case here, right? When you have an increase, uh, I'm sorry, a decrease in blood volume, but an increase in osmolarity. If you're dehydrated, antidiuretic hormone would come in. Um, and whereas, say you had, uh, you had, you were in this case where you had just drank a bunch of water, that would be a good time for atrial natriuretic hormone and aldosterone. So you can see by the combination of these different hormones, you can respond to each of these different uh, scenarios that you may, your body may find itself in. Is that? Yeah. So I'm not going to ask you to like know the mechanisms of that. Okay. Uh, sure, why not? <clears throat> so here's an example of low blood, blood pressure uh, and or high osmolarity. So what would that be from back here? Low blood pressure and high osmolarity. So that would be this one. Low, so what would we do in this situation? No, uh, no, 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 no. Pardon me. In the in the case of this one, dehydration. So low blood volume, high uh, high osmolarities. The dehydration. Um, well, first of all, is how does the body? What are the sensors for this homeostatic process? Uh, we have atrial barrio, uh, arterial barrel receptors. So those are in the aortic arch and the carotid bulbs. These are going to be things that are going to monitor the actual blood pressure. Is the blood pressure high or low? Barrow is just like a barometer. A barrel receptor is a sensory receptor that monitors pressure. Okay. Um, and then, uh, what about the salt side of it? Well, up here in the hypothalamus, we have these uh, cells in something called the paraventricular nucleus. Uh, you don't need to know the name of that, but uh, there are osmoreceptors that are in the hypothalamus that uh, are going to be sensitive to an increase in the plasma osmolarity. So uh, is there a lot higher osmotic pressure in the blood? Is there a lot of salt there? And there's going to be some comparative biomechanism there in those cells that will, that will be responsive to that. If there is, if either of these things happen, then uh, we're going to secrete uh, antidiuretic hormone. And antidiuretic hormone, uh, we, didn't, we didn't really get to talk about uh, the, the, neuro, uh, the neuro and the uh, adrenal uh, hypothesis, but this whole thing is the pituitary, right? That's the little berry that's sticking off the front of your brain stem uh, attached to the infundibulum below the hypothalamus. You guys remember that from, what was that, last Wednesday or something? Um, and these cells come down here and release antidiuretic hormone into this, uh, this hypophyseal portal system is what it's called, but basically just right into the bloodstream. And uh, it's going to come from the bloodstream and do two things. First of all, it's going to uh, directly cause its effect at the uh, kidney by the uh, reabsorption of water, and uh, then it's also going to lead to vasoconstriction in the circulatory system. That's going to bring the blood volume uh, and pressure up, antidiuretic hormone. So let's see what ha how it does this at the kidney. Here we are without antidiuretic hormone. Uh, so little water is being resorbed in the distal convoluted tubule in the collecting ducts, and because of that, we're going to make a large volume of dilute urine, all right? However, if antidiuretic hormone is there, uh, it, causes, it causes these uh, cells, these proteins called aquaporins, basically little water pores, uh, to get inserted in the membranes of uh, the, the distal convoluted tubule. And because of that, all of this water is going to get drawn 
off of the tubular fluid into the extracellular space. Remember, because of these, uh, this countercurrent multiplication in the nephron loop, there's this, this uh, concentration gradient of salt that's being made in this tissue right here. And so what we're doing with this collecting duct, we're putting aquaporins in and allowing water to flow across this barrier down its osmotic gradient, all right? So again, using salt uh, to, to draw that water in. And because of that, uh, with ADH, the aquaporins get inserted in the membrane and uh, we have a small volume of concentrated urine. This is the kind of thing that happens, for example, at night. Uh, a lot of times when you wake up in the morning, your urine is, it, is darker uh, than it normally is, hopefully during the day when you're drinking lots of fluid. And that's because uh, you're conserving fluid uh, during the night to stave off dehydration because you're not drinking any fluids. All right, antidiuretic hormone. You also sometimes will see the name vasopressin. Uh, you see vasopressin as a word that's used for ADH. Okay. Um, so how do we inhibit ADH uh, secretion? Well, um, there's this protein called atrial naturetic natriuretic protein, or hormone, uh, ANH. And it is produced by the atria, in the atrial walls of your heart. Holy cow, man. Can't one part of the body just do one thing? Lord, all these body parts doing all kinds of things. Well, the atria, uh, they expand when the blood flows in there. And uh, if... Uh, it's flowing too much and the body wants to, like if it's getting too stretched, like there's too much fluid volume, and the body wants to rid itself of the excess fluid volume, uh, the heart produces this uh, atrial natriuretic hormone. Uh, it's going to have a lot of uh, downstream effects. First of all, it's going to inhibit uh, cardiac cell growth, which, you know, that's, that's what that is but it's going to affect the hypothalamus, the pituitary, uh, and uh, by so doing, uh, inhibit secretion of ADH directly. Uh, then it's going to cause vasodilation uh, in the circulatory system. It's also going to increase uh, endothelial permeability so that water can get out of the blood, uh, bloodstream into the extracellular space. And then... It inhibits renin production at the kidney, uh, and also, uh, and also um, leads to naturesis and diuresis at the kidney. So ANH is one uh, mode of inhibiting ADH. All right. So here is kind of a an overview that's going to put all these things together into one. Picture. I just talked about uh, ANH. It's also called AMP, uh, atrial natriuretic peptide or atrial natriuretic hormone. I didn't talk about brain natriuretic peptide or hormone. It, it's, it does the same thing as AMP. It's just like cells in the brain make it as well. Um, so uh, we talked about how blood gets in. This is where we get our sodium, potassium, and water in the first place. Um, and... You know, depending upon what hap what, what's going on, whether the blood pressure is up or down, these are the major end effects uh, of, these, of these different hormones. So angiotensin II, uh, just to keep it straight in your head, angiotensin II is going to increase the blood pressure and uh, blood volume. I guess blood volume follows blood pressure. Aldosterone is going to increase uh, blood volume and blood pressure but uh, it's going to do so also by exporting potassium. So if, we, if you go back and you look uh, through those, the slides, one of the consequences of aldosterone is uh, potassium export as you import uh, sodium. So say you have too much potassium on board, on top of these, pro these problems, 
then aldosterone is going to uh, be the, the major uh, mode for normalizing blood volume and pr blood pressure. Whereas if serum potassium is not high, I didn't go through a lot of the regulatory mechanisms behind that. It's fairly sophisticated. Uh, but angiotensin does not lead to an export of potassium. Anyways, uh, so in general, angiotensin II and aldosterone have similar effects, as does uh, ADH. So it's going to in increase uh, blood volume and increase blood pressure. All right. Another summary slide. Uh, okay. Yeah, I got time. Proximal convoluted tubule. So the, the filtration happens at the, at the uh, renal corpuscle. The proximal convoluted tubule is where we're trying to resorb uh, the solutes that we lost, like the glucose and uh, sodium, for example, uh, potassium. We're also exporting uh, some nitrogenous waste and, and hydrogen ion there. Then we get into this descending loop, or the, this, this loop of Henle, the nephron loop. And the job of the nephron loop is to uh, resorb sodium and resorb water and set up a concentration gradient in the medulla of the kidney. Distal convoluted tubule, uh, its job is to, uh, it varies, but its job is to secrete um, Toxins is to unload potassium uh, if, if we need to. It's to also uh, resorb sodium and water and carbonate. So in general, the distal convoluted tubule is alkalizing the blood. And then uh, the collecting duct is just all about concentrating the urine um, with under the direction of ADH. So that's, that's a summary of the renal function. Okay, here are some nitrogenous wastes. What are the waste things that we'll find in the urine? Well, they all contain nitrogen. Um, and I guess, the, I, don't, I don't think I'd talk about it today. Uh, I certainly don't because I'm almost done. I think I'll talk about it tomorrow, the, con the concept of nitrogen balance. Um, so, uh, but all the nitrogenous wastes in our body uh, find themselves primarily in the urine rather than the feces. Uh, we have ammonia and urea, which are essentially breakdown products of amino acids, proteins which get uh, broken into amino acids, and the end stage for that is ammonia and urea. And then uh, nucleic acids are the other place in the body uh, where there's a lot of nitrogen. And uh, that leads to the production of uric acid um, and then uh, uh, creatine is also a nitrogen containing compound that is derived from the nucleic acids uh, and that can also end up in the urine. So all the, the waste products are either from proteins or nucleic acids, um, the nitrogenous waste in the urine. All right, so for the last five minutes here, I'm going to talk about uh, pathology, a little bit of pathology. So this diagram here just shows you the causes of kidney disease. Uh, almost half of uh, people with kidney disease have it because of diabetes mellitus, uh, about 45%. Um, and then the, the another third of people with uh, kidney disease have it because of high blood pressure, all right? Um, and then there are about 20% have other, uh, other problems. Tomorrow, so I, I, I've been like, the little bit of pathology I put in here, I'm sort of knitting a story together that you may not be completely aware of. I'm gonna take a lot of these threads that I've created and I'm gonna put them together and talk about um, metabolic disorder, uh, the, the concept of metabolic disorder, because uh, tomorrow is going to be metabolism. And you'll learn that uh, coronary artery disease and uh, types of cancer 
and diabetes and high blood pressure. These are all part of a suite of diseases called metabolic disorder. Uh, and that is, metabolic disorder is actually what connects diabetes and high blood pressure. Because both of those are sim symptoms of, of metabolic disorder. So fully uh, three quarters of kidney, kidney disease out there is because of metabolic disorder, right? Let's, let's take a, a look at diabetes mellitus. Well, uh, diabetes mellitus, there's two types. There's type 1, uh, and this is a juvenile onset diabetes. These are people who, uh, it's congenital. They're, they're typically born uh, to have diabetes, uh, and their pancreas just fails to produce insulin. They just don't make insulin. Uh, their body, their cells in their body are responsive to insulin, but uh, these people, you'll often see them with like insulin pumps. They have to wear an insulin pump. Um, and they can, lead, they can lead totally normal lives once they get that. Uh, um, and then there's type 2 diabetes. Um, and that's, a, that's the sadly 90% of the people out there with diabetes uh, have type 2. And this is called adult onset uh, diabetes. And... Um, it's, it's a real problem. It's really, uh, there are genetic factors, absolutely, that predispose you uh, to diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes. So, for example, every person in my dad's family uh, has type 2 diabetes, and because of that, I should be more conscious of my eating choices, right? So, uh, eating a lot of sugar and spiking your insulin leads to what's called insulin resistance, and that's what type Two is it's insulin resistance. Your pancreas, where is it? Yeah, over here. Your pancreas can make uh, insulin, but the cells in your body don't respond to it. They don't. They're not making the insulin receptors any longer on the surface of the cells, and so those cells are not able to take up the sugar that's in your blood. You know, when your blood sugar is chronically high because you're eating a ton of sugar all the time. Uh, then uh, the, the body starts being like, whoa, too much, hold on, whoa, insulin. Because like, your pancreas is like, holy crow, i got to make some insulin. It's pumping out the insulin, and then the cells in your body are like, whoa, insulin, back off. And insulin receptors get down-regulated, and you become resistant to uh, the insulin that's in your body. It is a problem. So you have uh, two to four times the risk of ischemic heart disease and stroke because of it. You have 20 times the risk of a lower limb uh, amputation. Uh, it's, the, it's the primary cause of uh, blindness um, out there, not non-traumatic blindness like somebody poking you in the eye otherwise. Uh, and uh, kidney failure. Um, it also leads to dementia. A lot of diabetics become uh, demented because of peripheral vascular disease uh, that is, is attendant with it, which is the peripheral vascular disease is why they, they get their limbs amputated. Uh, sexual dysfunction, so impotency, that's also a peripheral vascular problem. Uh, and diabetes mellitus knocks 10 years off your life expectancy in general. Um, a lot of symptoms. Uh, you can see systemic weight loss. What? How does that work? Like your blood sugar is super high, but the cells are starving. Your cell, you're literally starving. So a lot of the symptoms of diabetes are similar to symptoms of people who are starving. Um, so uh, like you can see a person who has been starving or who is an alcoholic uh, will have... Uh, a smell to their breath, a kind of sweet smell, sort of like acetone. Uh, and it's because of the ketone bodies, they're in ketoacidosis, the ketone bodies, from burning fat because they can't get the sugar in their cells. People with severe untreated type 2 diabetes also have that smell on their breath um, that, that you can see. So there's this uh, systemic weight loss, uh, the, the smell and the breath of ketoacidosis, uh, 
there. They can have blurred vision because of effects on the on the retinal arteries. Um, yeah, so there can be effects in their breathing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, urination because of effects at the at the kidneys. Uh, yeah, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and a lethargy or stupor. Uh, and that is because their blood sugar is high, but the brain can't take it up. And so their brain cells are starving too. So imagine if anybody's ever fasted for a while, what you feel like when you're fasting, you kind of like, like this a little bit. That's what it's like having diabetes, type 2 diabetes that's not been treated. So anyways, um, last slide here. I just have another minute. Uh, I love looking at this part of it because, you know, maybe some of you guys will go on to policy careers. You'll get your MD or something, who knows, and you'll go work for the World Health Organization or work for some actually responsive part of the federal government um, that will be functional in the future, presumably. Uh, yeah, 25.8 million children and adults in the United States. That's... Uh, 8% of the population. So this, these numbers are old. We'll have new numbers uh, in 2020 with the census. But um, yeah, that, that number is probably actually around 30 million now. Uh, so that says there's, there's about 20 million diagnosed and about 10 million undiagnosed. There's about 10 million people with, di with diabetes out there. It's like the population of New York City walking around this country that don't know they have diabetes. Um, those numbers are, are staggering, but this number is gnarly, man. There are 80 million Americans, 80 million Americans that are pre-diabetic. They're on the way, ready, ready for it. It's coming for them. Uh, pre-diabetic. Uh, that's that's serious. About two million new cases uh, in people 20 years older and older in 20 uh, 2010. So. <clears throat> Uh, in 1985, uh, there were 30 million people worldwide, but United States exported the American diet, the American diet, high fructose corn syrup, and uh, currently there's about 300 million. The entire population of the United States globally uh, has diabetes. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty staggering, man. It's, Almost 30% of the global population there has diabetes. You can see uh, where it is in North America. It's a North American problem. It's a North American diet that's been exported uh, to places throughout the world. Um, yeah, I mean, we live in Mongolia or Central Africa uh, to escape the American diet, I guess. But it's, it's spreading. So there you go. Some stuff to think about.